20 years later, in 1993, an American doctor, George Carlo, was charged with the responsibility of determining the health risk of cell phones. He directed a seven-year program of pivotal research into mobile phone use, funded by the cell phone industry. But they didn't like his findings, that the science was unclear, but that the risk seemed significant. George Carlo is now one of the world's most credible cell phone sceptics, and he says because we don't yet know the health risks, we must exercise caution. It is, it is very similar to the problem we had with the tobacco industry, but the, the, the difference here is that in the United States we have now 208 million people using cell phones. Around the world, I think at last count, there are 1.9 billion people using cell, cellular or mobile phones. So that we have never had, ever in history before, penetration of a consumer product like this. And because of the litigation ongoing here in the United States, the cell phone industry knows that they uh, will lose a couple of these lawsuits, and when they do, they're probably going to turn to the government for some type of bailout. So that the institutional arrogance that they are exhibiting is, is born of the fact that so many people use cell phones, so much of retirement investment funds that are in place are uh, tied to telecommunication stocks, they feel that they're almost untouchable. So at the end of the day, they feel that they're going to have a government bailout here in the United States that will probably follow them around the world. Okay, you talked about the roughly 2 billion people using cell phones, and this is rapidly increasing. New territories, Sierra Leone, for example, and new demographics in old territories, children, for example. In the states where you're based, Disney and a company called Sprint are actively targeting children. How do you see that? Well, this is really grotesque. Um, we have companies like the Disney Corporation, which built its reputation on uh, being friendly to children, who have partnered with Sprint here in the United States. And in this partnership, Disney is not only selling phones, but they're also a carrier of signals so that people who have the Disney phones would actually pay the Disney Corporation for the minutes. And uh, what, what is most grotesque about this is that they are targeting children between the ages of 8 and 12 years old. They actually have named them the tweener market. So that we, we have not only this very uh, gross marketing tactic aimed at children, but we also have the problem that the scientific studies, the epidemiological studies that have been done thus far are really studies of adults who have used the phone for 500 to 1,000 minutes a month, maybe over a period of 10 to 12 years. And those studies are showing us doubling and tripling in the risk of brain cancer and eye cancer. When you start talking about a child eight or nine years old beginning use, by the time they're 19 or 20 years old, they will have used the phone for 10 years, and we have no idea what type of risk that's carrying. The projections that we do have indicate that we are putting these children in unbelievable danger. I want to go back to the adults. You talk about those studies that show 500 to 1,000 minutes a month. That's about 15 to 30 minutes a day. That there is risk there, but it's low risk. What have the studies told us about heavy users, more than 30 minutes a day or 1,000 minutes a month? Well, the, the studies that have, been, that have been published so far are studies that have been done in the middle 90s to the early, early 2000s. So back then, there wasn't such widespread use of cell phones. And you're right, that is not a lot of time on the cell phone. We did a study here in Buffalo, New York, where we looked at teenagers and their cell phone use patterns. The average teenager in Buffalo uses his cell phone 2,600 minutes a month. And the behavior patterns are very different. Many of these children leave their phones on at night and put them under their pillow so that they can receive text messages from their classmates during the night. And this is the kind of thing that is unprecedented, and we have no idea how to estimate how big the risk really is with this type of usage. Okay, let's leave heavy usage and uh, hypothesis, estimation, and projection. And let's look at what the science actually tells us is happening to moderate users, say 15 to 30 minutes a day, pretty typical. What's science telling those people now? We have, we have conducted uh, or, or constructed epidemic curve projections and based on the epidemiological studies that have been published to date. And what they tell us is that today, 
there are between 30,000 and 50,000 new cases of brain and eye cancer attributable to cell phone use. By the year 2010, the projections say that number is going to be near 500,000 cases of brain and eye cancer every year attributable just to cell phone use. Those numbers are unprecedented. It's true that they're driven by the fact that in the world there are 1.9 billion people using cell phones, but we have never had this type of impending risk facing society. It is unprecedented, and I fear unprecedented in terms of the danger that it presents. Okay, let's go ahead and get into this report. Um, cell phone cover-up is your brain at risk, CNN News. CCN News. Now, again, I read these articles every day. I don't even cover them on air. I've kind of gotten conditioned not to, but you need to know, and I'm still habitualized. Habitualized means it's a habit to use a cell phone when I'm in the car for 30 minutes home, 30 minutes to work, sometimes an hour in traffic. I get a lot done on it. But the point is, you better have a hands-free. You better keep it at least three feet away from you. You better be careful, folks, and I know we all forget and still do it. It's frying your brain. I've cut back like 95%. Yeah, I put mine on speaker all the time, and I don't even mind that other people have to hear my conversations. I don't want that thing next to my ear. Every time it rings, if I have a speaker or my television on, you can literally hear the microwaves. You know, you hear that, and then all of a sudden your phone rings, you know. No, no, I mean, it takes hot-powered stuff to, 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 to disrupt Yeah, things. that's a real signal that could cause cancer in your body. I well, mean, here it is. it is. Cell phone cover-up. Is your brain at risk? The latest stone thrown to the $200 million a year cell phone industry came from a study by neurosurgeon Vin G. Krushuna. We're getting on the show entitled Mobile Phone Brain Tumor, Public Health Advisory. His meta-analysis of existing cell phone studies may not uh, contain a lot of information, but his rather alarming message was carried by media around the world. There is a growing body of statistical significant evidence for a relationship between the overall length and use of cell phone and the delayed on occurrence of brain tumor on the same side of the head as the preferred side for mobile phone usage. He claimed a two to four fold, and, and I've got hundreds of studies saying this, uh, increased risk following 10 years of regular use. The cell phone industry mobilized its behemoth defense machine, calling the study a select view of existing literature. This meant that his conclusions were not in line with all the studies the industry had been uh, funding around the world uh, called Interphone. And, and it just goes on and on, David versus Goliath. But they've got cell phone company studies. They've got government studies. They all say the same thing. They even admit, the cell phone companies admit that it heats the brain more than a degree and a half after 20 minutes. It's heating the brain. Very scary. I mean, again, you know, it's out there. People should really realize that if you have a, a mobile device of any sort, it's sending, you know, a microwave. It's sending out a signal, and that signal's probably not the best for you and me. You know, we're not, we're not adapted for that thing, for that sort of thing. We know that there are other technologies out there that have caused cancer in the past, and they've denied it and denied it and denied it, and then 40 years later, oh, yeah, it's bad for you. It's kind of like lead paint or asbestos. Well, it's kind of like you eating know? 100 Twinkies a day will do this. <laughs> Will it make you dance ridiculously with thug life? <laughs> It's bad news, Alex, but people are so addicted to technology. I mean, you know, again, it's it's only going to get worse. I, I really do believe that. I mean, we'll just accept anything. I mean, we really will. I mean, what's what's the next thing on the cell phone? Your cell phone already does just about everything. It's a video player. It's an MP3 player. You know, it's a calculator. It's an alarm clock. It, you know, it's this all-in-wonder machine. We're never going to get weaned off that. We're only going to get weaned towards the next step. You know, God knows what the next one's going to do because... Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. They phase it in. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I remember when uh, car phones were the big thing. Oh, my God, he's got a car phone. It's the mid-90s. I, I can't believe it. And then cell phones came out, but they were the size of a walkie-talkie, and you kind of thought to yourself, oh, that's never really going to get big. But now, you know, literally 12-year-old kids, 12-year-old and under kids, everybody's got a cell phone, every single person. And you should be warning your children. Well, that's especially. why I every week try to warn people. I really want to help people. I have this instinct to not want to hurt others. And uh, you're going to be real sad when your kid's 25, 26 years old and they've got a tumor in their brain. Well, they'll just rationalize it. Well, I, I really hope not. I hope you realize that that what was because this? of What about this? In 2007, I watched the videos called Control Factor and Enemy of the State. Uh, they came to me like a signal that I had to watch them, and 
for five years I have enlightened the Danes and, and other people about what the wireless society really does and what the mobile phone radiation really does and here I got all the answers that what I have come uh, come to uh, as conclusions as well um, and we are talking about psychotronic warfare we are talking about what these technologies actually do to the human mind and uh, what it actually does to the human spirit and the human soul it actually disconnects us from what we really are and in this way we become more and more like zombies like empty people just consuming just entertaining ourselves and just caught in pleasure all the time without any real purpose or substance in our lives psychotronic weapons in 1989, the, the Russians, they sold their psychotronic weapons or some of the psychotronic weapons in, in, in the situation where the perestroika was dissolved. Uh, but no one really knows what, uh, what or who bought these psychotronic weapons from the Russians. Um, and this is very, very exciting because we have this intuition going on when we, uh, when we found out about this that, of course, it was the biggest mobile, uh, mobile phone companies who bought these psychotronic weapons technologies because it can be used tremendously with the wireless systems. It's actually invented for this purpose to actually mind control, crowd control, population control totally. And then I watched this video with the guy called Dr. Deagle. He's a very interesting guy, and he knows a lot about many things. He's uh, yeah, he's 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 a good guy, and he was talking about what they were doing up in Helsinki in Finland. Uh, he was talking about the the Nokia, um, the Nokia company, the mobile phone company, and he said they are not really researching in mobile phones. Uh, that's not their main part, but the main part is researching in dialing up your cortex. And that is wh exactly what we are visiting, uh, watching. This is exactly what the movies uh, uh, Control Factor and Enemy of the State is all about. So please go and watch them if you don't have s uh, watched them already, but watch them again and, and see all the points and see how it all relates together with, with what it really is all about it's so obvious and how come people have been so dumbed down the last 10 years in Denmark in 1997 uh, it was the big mobile boom you know everyone got the mobile phone and it was only it didn't cost anything it, they don't cost anything today either uh, you just uh, get them almost for free which again indicates that there's another agenda because no technology in the world has ever been given for free almost. So if you watch these movies you will find out that uh, there's a lot of things going on which you can actually watch with your eyes if you l l open your eyes and look out and look at how people are looking and how they are reacting and, and, and they more and more become like zombies. Please also watch the interview called Mobile Phone Radiation, Switching of the Brain with the German Dr. Dirk because it's, it tells a lot about what is really going on in the brain and what is actually happening is that all these mobile phones and wireless systems we're having are actually mind control devices because they suppress us in thinking they separate our brain from working as an integrated brain and we lose contact with our deeper feelings and our intuition our soul our spirit and in this way we become more and more empty and we lose our purpose in life and this is exactly what you're watching in those two movies so please enlighten yourself about this and, and please add two and two because everything is obvious and the change has to come from within. Uh, we cannot change the world out there, we have to change it in here. So it all starts with each one of us and if you start to be aware about these things and change your lifestyle, then you can change the world. We are all the world, so please start by yourself and invest some time in yourself to find out what this is really about.
what I hope to do tonight is to talk a little bit about where we are today with the science, what we understand about the dangers. It's much different from what we understood a year ago. And it will be much different from what we understand six months from now. So what I'd like to do first, to give you some context, what I'm going to be talking about is to direct your attention to the, to the two screens. I bet you thought that was just psychedelic film. <laughs> well, actually, what that is, it's animation of the life of a cell. And while you're listening to me today, that stuff is going to actually occur hundreds of thousands of times in each of your bodies. Now, a couple of things I would like to point out. And the first is that when everything is working right, the body is an enormously beautiful machine. But when things are not working right, we have disease. There are a couple of things here that I would like to have you focus on and remember so that I can refer to them during the talk. Okay, these things here, those are microtubules. See those little connections between those two cells? Those are microtubules. And when everything is working right in a cell, you have two types of communication that occurs between cells. And as Alfred eloquently mentioned this, mor or this morning, or this afternoon, I'm sorry, you have cells that communicate and talk to each other. And when they talk to each other and work together, they form a tissue. And when you have tissues that talk together and work together, you have organs. And when you have organs and tissues that talk together and work together, you have an organism and we as human beings are an organism. And it is all based on the ability of cells to be able to communicate with each other. Now, these two different types of communication between cells involve microtubules and gap junctions. Now, microtubule communication is instantaneous energy communication. It occurs at the speed of light. That's why when you stub your toe in the, in the night, you feel it instantaneously. That is because there is instantaneous speed of light energy communication going through microtubules from your toe to your brain and back to your toe instantaneously. So microtubule communication is the energy communication. Now when things work properly, what happens is that the microtubule communication occurs first. And it tells the surrounding cells that something needs to be done working together. Something needs to be done. The microtubule communication is instantaneous, and the something that needs to be done is communicated through something called gap junctions. And that communication is chemical, and it's slower, and it's the big job communication. So microtubule communication occurs first, and then the big job gap junction communication occurs second. Now, you can turn that off now. Subtle energy interventions operate at the microtubule level. They operate at the microtubule level. So that what Alfred was talking about earlier today with the energy resonance technology, the target is microtubule communication. And when things are working right, if microtubule communication is efficient, 
then gap junction communication follows behind it. So if you handle microtubule communication, now you're handling everything that follows. That's when everything is working correctly. The difficulty is that with energy systems that go from cells through tissues, through organisms, the biofield, and you have external energies that compete or interfere, things are not going to be working properly. Now, over the past 20 years, scientists from around the world have studied very precisely what happens in the electromagnetic spectrum in terms of mechanisms of harm to organisms like human beings. It turns out that all electromagnetic radiation is not created equal. There are at least three different effect windows that operate through different mechanisms. One effect window has to do with extremely low frequency radiation, the type of radiation that comes from electric power lines, the type of radiation that you have in leakage in your home. And the mechanism of harm there is direct magnetic influence. At the other end of the spectrum, you have another window that occurs with ionizing radiation, X-rays and gamma rays. The mechanism there is high energy breaking of chemical bonds so that in the ionizing radiation part of the spectrum, there's so much energy that it can directly break DNA and other chemical bonds. Now, because we have understood those two effect windows for almost 100 years, the assumption was made that radio frequency radiation was going to operate through the same mechanisms. That is why, in the early 1980s, <clears throat> When cell phones were first introduced in Europe, in Europe in 1981, in the United States in 1984, they were exempted from pre-market safety testing. And the reason was because the industry convinced the government regulatory authorities that the mechanisms of harm from radio frequency radiation were direct magnetic, or ionizing. And based on that, cell phones and subsequent wireless technology went into the marketplace never having been tested for safety. Never having been tested for safety. Now, in the ensuing years, everything was fine with that decision until Larry King, live, ran a show with a fellow by the name of David Raynard, whose wife had died of a brain tumor, and she was pregnant. And during her pregnancy, he bought her a cell phone. And her surgeon, David Perlmutter, believed that the tumor was related to her cell phone use because the tumor was a very unusual tumor called a neural epithelial tumor. It was a type of tumor that started on the outside of the head and grew inward. He had never seen one of those before. So that he went on the Larry King live show with her x-rays and showed that the pattern of her tumor was the pattern of where the antenna from the cell phone was. Now the next day, Motorola stock went down by a few points. And two days later, the industry held a big press conference. And at that press conference, they reassured the public in no uncertain terms 
that there were literally thousands of studies that had been done to prove that cell phones were safe and that there was nothing to worry about. And the media said, well, that's good news. Where are the studies? And they didn't have any. And they tried to show the media studies of microwave ovens. And even the media could figure out that you don't put a microwave oven next to the side of your head. <laughs> so what happened was congressional hearings were called for. And during those congressional hearings, it became clear that cell phones had not been tested for safety, that we had no idea whether or not they were indeed safe. There were 15 million Americans and about 50 million people at the time around the world using cell phones, and we had a problem. So the industry stepped up to the plate and said, we'll put what became $28.5 million into a research fund. And that research fund will be used to study the safety of cell phones. And the deal was that if the government doesn't regulate us until the research is done, then we have a deal. And of course, that deal was struck. This big program was put together. I was the person who they gave the $28.5 million to. <clears throat> we went forward and did work. Now, Let's jump ahead to today. Today, we have two times 10 to the ninth people using cell phones, which is 10 to the ninth less than a gazillion. <laughs> okay. So it's a whole bunch of people. Where's John Williams? <laughs> You'll get there, partner. Don't worry. <laughs> so we have two billion people now using a technology that we don't yet understand completely about safety. Now, what we know is that radio frequency radiation is unlike any other type of radiation that the human organism has ever seen. So that we have not been able to adapt a compensation mechanism to protect us from electromagnetic radiation. And that is electromagnetic radiation in all three effect windows. What we know is that most wireless communication has carrier wave frequencies in the 1900 to 2000 megahertz range. Now, your heart beats at two hertz, two cycles per second. 1900 megahertz is 1900 million cycles per second. That frequency oscillation is so high that biological tissue cannot recognize it. So that on that basis, radio waves in and of themselves simply pass through human being without doing damage. The problem is that those radio waves don't exist in nature, and the only way they exist in real life is with information on them, with information on them. Now, when I was a young boy, my, my mother had a clothesline that was on pulleys. So you pull the clothesline and the clothes would go out and then you pull it back and the clothes would come back in. Now, the way the 1900 megahertz carrier wave works is like that clothesline. 
It is the clothesline that carries the signal from a cell phone, from a PDA, from a wireless computer hookup to a base station. So that is the clothesline, the carrier wave. But your body can't see the clothesline. Now when you put clothes on the clothesline, it is the equivalent of putting data packets on a carrier wave. Because it's necessary for information to be interpreted from your cell phone to the person who's answering the phone at the other side. In order for that to happen, information is put in packets, and those packets are put on the carrier wave. And it's the equivalent of having that clothesline full of clothes, and you pull it rapidly. And as it's moving through space, those clothes start to wave back and forth. And that's exactly what happens with the information secondary wave. It begins to oscillate on top of the carrier wave in the Hertz range, and that can be recognized by the human body. So that the first take home point is that the danger comes from information carrying radio waves. Anytime you have a communication device that is sending information somewhere, it is packeted information, and that packeted information forms a secondary wave that is recognized by the body. Now, how is the information recognized? Well, it all goes down to the cell. And the cell membrane has protein sensors on the outside of the cell membrane that vibrate. And when this information carrying wave comes in the vicinity of the vibrating protein, they communicate with each other. It's like the dueling banjos song. The incoming wave goes da 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 dum dum. And then the protein vibrator goes da 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 dum dum. And then the other one goes da 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 da. And then the protein thing goes da 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 da. And there's recognition. So that for recognition to happen, you need to have what's called resonance. These need to be vibrating in the same way. But once the recognition happens, the cell membrane has to interpret whether this is good information or bad information. And it has no experience with information carrying radio waves. So it interprets it as a foreign invader so that you have this recognition on the cell membrane that occurs in milliseconds, just like that. It takes about three to five seconds for the interpretation to happen. The cell membrane trying to figure out whether this is good or bad. And it always interprets it as bad because it doesn't know what it is. Because those information carrying radio waves do not exist in nature. And when the cell membrane recognizes this as bad, it sends a message to surrounding cells through the microtubules. It says, we're under attack. We're under siege. Protect yourself. We're going to protect ourselves. And one of the things that the cell membrane does is send a message that results in closing down active transport channels in the cell. And we, we call that hardening of the cell membrane. The permeability of the membrane is compromised. Nutrients cannot get in the cell. Waste product cannot get out of the cell. Now, because nutrients cannot get into the cell, the cell loses energy. So the cell becomes energy deficient. And when the cell is energy deficient, it's not able to communicate through microtubules. The reason is because microtubule communication 
is like sending a laser. It's instantaneous light energy. It takes a lot of power, a lot of energy to push that signal through the microtubule so that the intercellular communication, the rapid intercellular communication gets shut off. So now the cells are not able to talk to each other. And when the cells are not able to talk to each other, the tissues are not able to be efficient. And the organs are not able to be efficient. And the organism gets sick. And that's why when you intervene with a subtle energy intervention, immediately you get a positive response because the intercellular communication is restored because the subtle energy comes in and it vibrates on the microtubules. Now the microtubules are usually full of water. Now in order for there to be communication, energy communication, the microtubule has to contract and expand. It has, it has to go <gasps> like that. And when that happens, there's a little hole in the water channel. And that's where the signal goes. Now when you bring in the subtle energy from the outside, it causes the microtubule to go <gasps> and that's what restores the intercellular communication. Now, the other thing that happens is that waste product can't get out of the cell. So now you have a buildup of waste and in that waste you have free radicals. Now free radicals are interesting I trust I'm not the only person in the audience who participated in the 60s. We, it has nothing to do with whether I inhaled or anything like that. It is, and a free radical always likes a party. A free radical will always go where the action is. And inside the cell, the action happens at the mitochondria. The mitochondria are always having a party. That is where all of the energy from the cell is developed. It's the respiratory center of the cell. So what happens is these free radicals go to the mitochondria. They crash the party. And when that happens, the mitochondria, whose job it is to provide energy for the cell, becomes further compromised. So energy in the cell goes down more. Now the other thing that happens is that inside the cell you have something called messenger RNA. Now messenger RNA is part of the genetic material. And what the messenger RNA does is it floats around in the cell and it just is sort of like the bouncer at a party want to make sure everything's going fine. And if it sees something that is not going fine, it folds itself in a certain way so it can carry a message to the DNA. Now what happens when the cell is under siege and the active transport channels are closed down, the messenger RNA take that information from the inside of the cell membrane and they take that information to the DNA, both in the nucleus and in the mitochondria. When the messenger RNA comes in and starts to convey that information, it results in a whole bunch of pieces of messenger RNA and DNA to be unbound inside the cell. And when those pieces of messenger RNA and DNA are unbound, they're highly reactive they are viewed by the free radicals as a party. The free radicals go and now they disrupt the process of information transfer from the messenger RNA to the DNA. A result of that is the formation of something called micronuclei. And micronuclei are pieces of DNA 
or messenger RNA that function well enough to form a membrane around themselves. So now what you have inside the cell are these pieces of DNA that have formed a membrane around themselves and they're floating around in the cell. And that would be fine, except that because the free radicals have disrupted the mitochondria, the mitochondria now sends a message to the rest of the cell saying, I cannot do my job anymore. I'm going down. The ship is going down. And that triggers something called apoptosis. And apoptosis is when a cell commits suicide to make room for a fresh cell. And when you have that premature triggering of apoptosis, now you have the cell bursting open. And under normal circumstances, that would be fine because the pieces of waste and the pieces of micronuclei that are released into the interstitial fluid, the river between cells, would normally be gobbled up by globulins from the immune system. But somebody's got to make the call to the immune system. And we have compromised intercellular communication. That call is never made. So now what happens is you have these micronuclei who are released into nutrient-rich intercellular fluid. And they have a ball. And they proliferate. And they clone themselves. And that is a mechanism that leads to the development of tumors. When the intercellular communication is disrupted, Depending on when in life that occurs, you have different symptoms. If that occurs in utero, the symptom you have might be autism. And if that occurs during teenage years, the symptom you have might be attention deficit disorder or unexplained anxiety. And if that occurs in very late decades of life, you may have Parkinson's or Alzheimer's disease. So the disruption of intercellular communication leads to all of those clinical conditions. So that when you disrupt intercellular communication, you can lead to a whole host of serious diseases. But the situation is worse than that. Because what happens is that depending on where the cell is in its life cycle, it may not trigger premature apoptosis. The message from the messenger RNA goes to the DNA and says, we're under siege. Close down those active transport channels. And instead of the mitochondria triggering apoptosis, the cell goes through normal mitosis, which is normal cell division. And when that happens, the genetic material that was changed by the messenger RNA, goes to the daughter cells. So now you have daughter cells that think that they're under siege. And then those daughter cells duplicate with the bad genetic information. And as that process continues, you have something called electrosensitivity. So that electrosensitivity is an environmentally induced genetic change. And when a person is electrosensitive, they will react in an allergic manner to any exposure to an electromagnetic field. That's why 
you have people who are electrosensitive who can sense a cell phone call before the phone rings. And that's why you have some people who are electrosensitive who can walk into a room and have such a splitting headache because there's Wi-Fi in the room that they can't stay there. Here's what the problem is. We run a registry in the Safe Wireless Initiative, and that registry is there to collect symptoms from people who believe they have been harmed by cell phones or other sources of electromagnetic radiation. When we began the registry in 2002, we had a million people visit the registry within the first two months. And almost all of the complaints had to do with cell phones. Almost all of them had to do with cell phones. In the past six months, almost all of the complaints in our registry have to do with electrosensitivity. Now, in the old days, five years ago, we were mainly concerned about the area six or seven inches around the cell phone antenna. We called that the near-field radiation plume. And we were concerned about that because the power necessary to carry the signal to a base station resulted in a plume that had a high concentration of information carrying radio waves. And that's why we recommended that people use headsets to move the antenna away so that they were six or seven inches beyond the near field plume and that would mitigate the risk. Today, in most major cities in the world, the difference in concentration of information carrying radio waves in the area right next to the cell phone antenna and the background is almost not discernible. In some places like Toronto, in the last five years, the concentration of information carrying radio waves has increased 500,000 times. Now, in that effect window, where we have in milliseconds recognition and then in three to five seconds interpretation of harm and then in 30 seconds to a couple of minutes the process of shutting down active transport. In that window there is no threshold. What that means is that there is no safe level of exposure to information carrying radio waves. In the lower window, where you're talking about the electromagnetic fields, the extremely low frequency coming from electrical outlets, there is a threshold. And up at the high window, where you have X-rays and gamma rays, there is a threshold, meaning that there is a level of exposure where the body's compensation mechanism is greater than the amount of damage done. But in the RF effect window, there's no safe level. That means that if you have one cell exposed to an information carrying radio wave, it goes through that process of recognition, interpretation, and going through the process of self-preservation and protection. There is no safe level. Now,
15, 20 years ago, there were information carrying radio waves. Remember in the old days when we used to have these TVs with those antennas on the top of the house? And then there was an antenna on the top of a mountain. And what it did was it sent an information carrying radio wave from the antenna on the mountain to the antenna on your house. And then it converted it into some type of hardwire communication and it went to your television. So there were information carrying radio waves. But you weren't exposed to them because they were up in the air. Every time you make a cell phone call, you are bringing those information carrying radio waves down to earth. Every time you make a call, you're bringing that clothesline with the clothes and the wave down to the street. And what that means is that exposure today to information carrying radio waves is almost unavoidable. It's almost unavoidable. Now, We understand a great deal now about the mechanism of harm. We understand that there are three windows. We understand that the RF window, there's no threshold. We understand that the problem is triggered initially by something that happens at the cell membrane level. We understand that the disruption of intercellular communication is something that happens secondarily to that recognition. We understand that if that damage continues, that it changes the genetic material of the cell and it carries it on to daughter cells. And that's why we have electrosensitivity and that's why we have autism and that's why we have those other self-propagating conditions. Now, Do you ever wonder what scientists think about when they go to bed? <laughs> well, <clears throat> it isn't what you think. We go to bed wondering about what if we could stop that damage happening at the cell membrane level? And what if we could restore all of that intercellular communication. And if we can do that, then we can reverse the damage. We can stop the damage. And wouldn't it be great if you could prove it? <laughs> <laughs> 